We're going to talk about how not to get ripped off when you get a piercing or pay too much. Coming up next on Body Piercing Basics, episode 141. For those who are new to the Body Piercing and Tattooing channel, welcome to the channel. Hope you're finding the videos helpful, useful, and somewhat entertaining. But you might not know who I am. My name is Debo. I'm a professional body piercer and have been since 1994. I own and operate the Axiom Body Piercing Studio located right here in Des Moines, Iowa, inside Skin Kitchen Tattoo. So what we're going to talk about today, kind of the reason why it sparked was uh, the whole tattoo gate thing that's been going around the internet about that poor lady that spent $2,600 on a tattoo and didn't even see the inside of the studio. Um, we're going to probably do a, a Q&A in the kitchen, our podcast, when uh, all four of us could sit down and talk about it, probably here in a couple weeks, but I'm not going to address that today. Let's talk about the piercing side of that. Things you need to look for, things that uh, maybe aren't kosher. And also, uh, what goes into the general pricing of piercings and why some places are more expensive than others? So, there's four types of uh, piercing establishments or places, businesses that do piercing. First one is the boutique. Now, boutiques are kind of uh, generally in really high-end retail areas, maybe fashion areas. Think Maria Tosh. Um cheapest piercing there is like $250. It's like one of those places that you go into and you realize that if you have to ask what the price is, uh, you can't afford it. Uh, they're really exclusive and their whole target audience is, well, uh, people that like to spend a lot of money on piercings and wealthy people. Now, the next type is the good old-fashioned body piercing studio. Uh, kind of what the Axiom is, where we're more interested in piercing people of all different price levels and affordability levels, meaning uh, those that have less disposable income can afford to get pierced by us, but at the same time, those that have a little bit more disposable income can, in, can buy the very expensive jewelry. We stock, uh, I mean, for example, you could do an ear piercing or upper ear piercing for about $75.00 all the way up to a couple hundred bucks, maybe more. Um, it really depends on what you're willing to spend and what you want. And my idea is I want everyone to have that opportunity to get pierced by me or, my, or Shannon or at the studio. It's not exclusive. We're not a boutique. But also we want to make sure that our clients have a great experience and it's safe, clean, and et cetera. The next type is often referred to in the industry as the street shop. This is a place that usually is more about volume and opposed to quality. It's about getting people in and out as quickly as possible. Um, this is the kind of places where you have piercers that maybe train for a day or two and then do $25 piercings with really crappy jewelry. Um, and it's all about getting people in and out. They may have like 15 tattoo artists that work there. Um, of various different levels and degrees of expertise and experience. Same thing with the piercers. And the last type is the add-on or uh, added-on service type business, where the main source of business there is maybe uh, a salon or a spa or a jewelry store or, I don't know, a pawn shop. And they also offer piercings, usually done uh, with a ear piercing device and not done correctly and with low-quality jewelry at a very inex inexpensive amount. Now let's talk about price. Uh, what causes some places to be more expensive than others? Because a common question I get asked is, I'll have somebody call me, or leave a comment from Boston, Massachusetts, saying, is blah, blah, blah a fair amount to pay for this piercing? And it's like, well, yeah, it kind of is, depending on what the market's like there. So what are the things that contribute to the cost of a piercing? The first one being is um, high-end retail locations can dictate how much it's going to cost. If they have a really high overhead, it's going to be more expensive. The next thing is, is the cost of getting anything in a larger city or larger metropolitan area. If you live in a city of, let's say, 10,000 people, it's going to be a lot cheaper to go to your local shop and get pierced there than it's going to be if you live in a city of... I don't know, 2 million people, because everything's more expensive when you have a denser population. 
when there's a scarcity of studios versus the amount of business they're going to get, that means they're going to pay more in rent. It means they're going to pay more in utilities, licensing. Everything is going to go through the roof. And thus, to stay profitable, they have to offset some of that cost to you. Next thing is market. How much demand is there? Um, if there's a scarcity of piercers in that area, they can set the price. If they're the only piercer that stocks that particular style of jewelry, they can set the price. If they're the most experienced person in that city or has the biggest reputation or really established uh, business, they can set their own price. Um, in areas where there's a lot of piercers, you're going to probably see a slightly lower price because the demand is not as high. And just like I mentioned earlier with the city thing, if the cost of living where you're at is higher than uh, it is in other places, of course, the beer is going to cost more, along with uh, the price of milk, pork chops, and just about everything else. Next thing is experience. How much experience does that piercer have? Somebody that's been in the industry for 20, 30 years can charge a lot more than somebody that's just finished an apprenticeship and maybe opened up a shop and has been open about six months. Uh, experience should does dictate how much they make, um, and they've earned that right to charge extra. Jewelry costs. This is the main thing that most... This has a lot to do with how much you're going to pay for a piercing. Um... Quality jewelry just simply costs more. That's the bottom line. Uh, it's a reality that you have to deal with. If you want good stuff, you're going to have to pay for it. Also, stuff that's biocompatible jewelry is going to cost more than less biocompatible. For example, titanium is going to cost more than implant-grade stainless steel because it's uh, more biocompatible, more expensive to process, and it's going to have a bigger range of people that can use that jewelry mainly because it's more biocompatible if that makes sense the last thing with jewelry is the selection the person has if they have a larger selection of jewelry it's going to be a little bit more expensive from the standpoint if they have more of an investment their costs are higher it's really cheap to go hey i've got five options for you to choose from and like a big if you think like target or a big box store. One of the reasons why they keep those prices so low is they only give you a limited amount of options, which means that their overall cost is going to be less because they don't have to stock as much stuff, taking up as much uh, shelf space, and thus not as much of an investment. So the smaller the investment, the cheaper they can do the piercings. Uh, if you go into a shop where they have like maybe 20 or 30 options or two or 300 options like us, uh, it's going to be a little bit more expensive just from the standpoint of you have more options. Now let's get into the meat and potatoes. Uh, the thing that most people go, uh, why, why does it cost so much? You're only going to take 20 minutes to do this. What does a piercing actually cost? Now the piercing, if you just separate it, you're looking at needles, pouches for sterile, sterile jewelry, ex tools, etc., gauze, the tools themselves and the investment that involves, saline, lubricant, markers, um, aftercare sheets, anything that's printable that you hand out to your clients, uh, sheets to cover the, uh, the piercing table or chair, um, sterile drapes for your setup, uh, gloves, and then labor. The part that most people don't think about is they only see you for like 20, 30 minutes, maybe tops to do a piercing. So they're like, wow, that guy makes a lot of, or that gal, or they make a lot of money in a very short period of time. The problem with this thinking is, is it doesn't take into account everything that needs to be done before that can happen. And that's where a lot of the labor comes when it comes to piercing. And that involves, uh, you know, of course, labor is involved with the piercing itself, but also the cleaning and processing of tools, um, sterilizing them, cleaning them between each usage, disinfecting, decontaminating, all of that stuff, um, processing the jewelry. I don't think we really understand um, when we get in a shipment of like over a thousand pieces, that means that either Shannon or I have to sit down and individually place each one of those pieces of jewelry in a pouch, then sterilize it, then um, put a label on it, and then stock it. Every single piece that can take hours upon hours upon hours to do. Um, it's very labor intensive. Then there's anodizing. 
it takes time to do it properly, and it's going to involve probably re-sterilizing the uh, jewelry again, so the pouches and the sterilizing and all that stuff all over again. So, yeah, there's a, it's a very labor-intensive scene behind the scene. And then we get into operating costs, of actually operating the studio. You have rent, utilities, licensing staff. If you need somebody to answer the phones or you need someone to help with cleaning, et cetera, that's something you're going to have to pay for. Supplies, um, maintaining a sterilizer or sterilizers in most cases, a couple different autoclaves in most cases. Maintaining an ultrasonic tank, which takes a little bit of supply and et cetera, plus the initial investment, and maintaining an anodizer, which also means additional supplies and et cetera. Now, I'm just going to go through some basic things that you should probably try to avoid or kind of like red flags that maybe this isn't the place you should be um, or you should take into account when they price it out or what have you. Uh, this is not in any particular order. It's just kind of a basic thing. First thing is bait and switch. Now, it's kind of confusing to people. There's a difference between baiting and switching and upgrading. Baiting and switching is where they advertise or claim a product. Then you get in there, and it's either much more expensive or the product that they're advertising is completely out, so you have to buy a more expensive product. Uh, Best Buy was notorious for this for years where they advertised like a really great deal on a stereo and then you get there and they sold out four days ago and the next cheapest option is a couple hundred dollars more. So they have this automatic built-in upgrade way to draw people in and sucker them into buying more expensive equipment than what they need. With piercing, there is always going to be an upgrade. Um, usually with that involves the jewelry or additional costs like buying saline or what have you. When I quote prices on my my piercings, I have a flat rate that involves basic jewelry. Then if they want better jewelry or maybe a different piece of jewelry that's more expensive, then uh, we deduct the cost of that basic jewelry and then add on. So let's say my base price is $75. The particular piece of jewelry they're replacing retails for $10, and they want a piece that's $25. So it's going to be an additional $50, bucks, which, or $15, bucks, not $50. So it's going to be another, it's going to be $90. Bait and switch version of this is when you call somebody up on the phone or you look at their website, they say the piercing is, you go, hey, how much does it cost to do uh, an ear piercing? And they go, $25. And then you get there. And they inform you at the end of the piercing or before they get started, depending on how upfront they are about their pricing, that the cheapest piece of jewelry they have is $275. So that ear piercing is really going to cost $300. This is a pretty common topic or, or tactic in the uh, boutique style places. Um, it's a good idea to always ask before you sit down in that chair or commit to getting the piercing done what the overall cost is going to be. And they should easily and quickly, voluntarily tell you that amount. The next one would be charging for a consultation or a curation. Uh, this idea that you're going to have to pay somebody to sit down and talk to you about uh, getting something that you have to pay for. Uh, is a little ridiculous to me. Uh, many times consultations are more about educating the client and finding out whether or not they really want that particular piercing. And without that consultation, they're unaware of what it's going to involve and whether or not they're willing to commit to it. It also can affect with the, with the curation thing, um, Marking out a bunch of piercings and taking five minutes to do a special custom blah, blah, blah for you isn't, if it's worth it for you, fine. But the reality is, is most of us will do that for free because we really enjoy doing projects like that. Uh, if you give me a big space to work with and give me options and say, hey, what do you think is going to work best jewelry wise, and et cetera, I'm going to be excited about that and willing to do it. And I'm not going to charge you extra for it. That's silly. Next one is no upfront pricing. There is not a flat fee listed anywhere. Um, they're not really very, they're kind of vague about the pricing. Um, there's maybe some hidden fees that you're unaware of, or it's really unclear and confusing. Recently, we had a client come in and, got, and they got multiple piercings, I think four on one uh, in one sitting. And uh, even though Shannon clearly went through what each one of them was going to cost, by the time we got they got done, 
she was completely confused on the price and was kind of angry about how much it was going to cost. So I have just recently implemented a policy that anytime we do more than two piercings, uh, we write out an estimate and hand it to the person so they know exactly how much it's going to cost. I'm always really adamant of making sure that before we get into it, the person knows how much they're going to be spending. Um, it'd be really easy, like I said, if you're one of those people that price isn't an option or, you know, you can afford it, I guess it'd be great. But the reality is, is most of us want to know what something costs before we commit to it. The next big warning flag is if they don't seem to have the time to go through a consultation with you or answer some questions. Uh, if they seem very closed off and just in a hurry to get you in the chair and they don't want to talk to you and it's really cheap, probably not the place you want to be. Um, the opposite could be said if it's really, really expensive. Uh, it kind of has this attitude of, uh, oh, you're not worth my time. Now, if the person's not willing to give you their time, their expertise, their knowledge, et cetera, before you get the piercing, do you think they're going to have any, you're going to have any support afterwards at all? The next one is no clear idea of where that jewelry came from or what it's actually made out of. Uh, any piercer that's worth their weighted salt is going to have a basic idea of or can tell you quickly what the pedigree of that particular piece of jewelry is, where it came from, who the manufacturer was, and what it was made out of, or the supplier at least. Um, you know, if you go in some place and they're like, oh, I don't know, it could have came off a turnip truck for all they know. It could be some guy in the back that gets paid 50 cents an hour to wrap uh, stainless steel wire around a pencil and put a bead on it. Um, you really need to know exactly where that jewelry comes from and whether or not it is, in fact, biocompatible, especially if you have any type of sensitivities to metal. Next one is if the piercing seems like a side business. If it's a situation where it seems like they're stopping, uh, I don't know, working on the transmission on George's truck to go pierce you, that's probably not a place that you want to be in, and it's not a place where they've decided to dedicate any real effort to becoming a body piercer. I, it, I've i always had this kind of weird thing with tattooists that sideline or piercers uh, well, not so much piercers that they go on to tattoo, because usually what happens is they go on to tattoo and they decide they're not going to pierce anymore. That's the most common thing that happens. And also, there's a lot of people that will, that's the way they got into the business was becoming a piercer and then worked their, weaseled their way into getting tat or getting becoming a tattoo artist, which is all they really wanted to do in the first place. So if it seems like they're just not interested in what they're doing or it seems like you're, uh, they're, they're more interested in their main business, like pawn brokering or, uh, I don't know, liquidating <laughs> furniture, I don't know. If it seems like there's a little corner dedicated to this and it's not really something they're really into, it may not be your best place to be. The next one is if your studio has only good reviews or no reviews. Uh, I don't care who you are. Anybody that's been in business knows this. There's no such thing as having a perfect score on Yelp or Google or what have you. The reality is is that even the best customers, uh, there's going to be one of them that goes, yeah, I only give four stars. I never give five stars to anything. Um, or they feel like you've gone four stars but not quite to five. Or they you said something that, that wasn't really offended, offending, offending, but for some reason or another, you don't get along, so they give you a one star, even though the review claims that you did really great at what you did. Because I've had that happen. So I'd be very leery of any business that doesn't have any reviews or all the reviews are positive. Because 10 to 1, they're doing something to curate them um, in getting rid of any negative responses. Or they basically are just having their employees and people they know actually write the reviews. Now, uh, the other thing you want to look at is whether or not they respond to all the reviews, the positive and the negative, especially if there's negative ones. It's important as a business person to learn from uh, the input of your clientele, and reviews are great for that because it may present a problem that you were unaware of. And taking the time to read them and then respond to them and put into action ways to fix that shows that that person cares about their business and cares about piercing and what they do for a living. Offers no guarantees, um, doesn't stand behind their work, what have you. It should be built into their program that there either is a set amount of time or a lifetime where they guarantee the quality of the jewelry against defect and 
they guarantee their piercings against issues. And if there's any mistake made or there's an issue with the piercing or the jewelry, they should willingly step up and fix the problem. Um, I'm a real big advocate of being accountable of your actions. Everybody has bad days. Um, every once in a while, a piece of jewelry slips by inspection during the processing. It's your responsibility as a piercer to fix that problem, to go, hey, that's screwed up. That's kind of my fault. Let's fix it. That's it. Instead of trying to blame the client for everything. Um, I have always believed, and I think this is a standard policy with most piercers, my job's not done until that piercing is completely healed. I, regardless of how well you take care of it or whatever, it's my responsibility to try to make sure that you get a piercing that heals correctly. And if something goes wrong during that process, I'm going to do what I can free of charge to try to fix the problem. For example, let's say you have a helix piercing and we guessed uh, the jewelry size at five sixteenths, which was giving you tons of room. But for one reason or another, you're one of those people that just swells really, really bad and it's well beyond it. I, you come into my studio, I take a look at it and go, yep, we need to fix this, and I'm going to replace that post for free. I'm not going to charge you for it because I didn't guess correctly. I didn't estimate. I didn't do that. You know, my knowledge said this size, and for one reason or another, because we deal with the human body, your body said, nope, not long enough. But that's my fault, not yours. Charging to change jewelry. There is a case where I would say that it is completely in line to charge for jewelry. If it's a situation where the piercing studio has a single usage on all tools. I think that's ridiculous, wasteful, and uh, I could go on and on about that. I'll probably do a video on it one day. But there are some studios that everything they use, they dispose of medical waste every time. So if they're going to unwrap and use a brand new hemost set of hemostats and a brand new guide pin then yes, I can see charging 20 bucks when they're going to go ahead and dispose of probably 10 to $15 worth of equipment each time or give it to the client. Now, if they're just reusing, um, you know, reprocessing, decontaminating the whole thing, the same tools over and over again, I don't see why they're charging you $20. It doesn't make any sense to me. To me, that's something that should be included in the overall price of the piercing. Plus, it's good for uh, – it creates a, a situation where your clients are more likely to come back and let you change it, so less damage to the piercing, less likelihood of them not be able to get the jewelry back in, and less problems. So, more success. Well, that's all I have to say about this today. I hope you learned something. I hope you I, – I gave you some red flags to look for and some things to think about the next time you go get pierced. Till next time, here's hoping only piercing seal with ease and without a single issue. And if you're in the Des Moines, Iowa area, I hope to see you for your body piercing needs in the future. Have a good day, everybody. Take care, and we'll see you in the next video.